Ladies and gentlemen, the forum is about to begin. Please switch off your mobile phones or set them to silent mode. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Practitioner Speaker Series, Navigating Your Career in Financial Services in the Right Place at the Right Time, jointly presented by HKU Faculty of Business and Economics and the Financial Services Development Council, FSDC for short. I'm Ines Tang, a year three student in the BBA Accounting and Finance program. I'm the MC and also the Q&A moderator for today's forum. What does FSDC do? The HKSAR government established the FSDC in 2013 as a high-level cross-sectoral advisory body to engage the industry in formulating proposals to promote the further development of Hong Kong's financial services industry and to map out the strategic direction for development. The FSDC set of six committees, namely the policy research, the mainland opportunities, the new business, the market development, the human capital, and the corporate governance committee as the six streams of its work. The FSDC Practitioner Speaker Series is a project developed between FSDC and local university and institutions. They invite speakers from the financial services industry to give talks to university students and young graduates about the important industry facts and the skill sets required in developing a career in financial services to help young people better understand and plan their careers in the financial services industry, the FSDC career website has launched in October 2016. The website contains useful information about jobs across various financial sectors, such as asset management, banking, insurance, professional services, financial regulations, securities brokerage, and wealth management. You can also find videos and interviews with industry professionals and hiring specialists. The website also includes a recruitment platform called Job Market, which is tailored for financial services employers to post their job openings for free of charge. If you would like to learn more on what FSTC has to offer, do feel free to visit their website at this link here. I hope everyone gets to know more about FSTC now. So moving on to today's forum, we are honored to have Dr. Al King Lin and Mr. Henry Chen to share with us their views and many years of experience and tell us what are the career opportunities for young graduates in the financial services industry. Before that, I'd like to invite Professor Dragon Tang, Area Head of Finance and Associate Director of the Vi Center for Financial Innovation and Development of HKU to give a welcome speech. Professor Tang, please. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm very happy to be here, especially uh, really appreciate the uh, FSDC and uh, Dr. Kim Ong Oh and uh, Henry uh, coming here. I understand that actually you have a very busy schedule. So the last time I was actually at a value partner uh, for a visit and our meeting was cut short because the gold price like had a big hit about six years ago and uh, my value partner was actually had a uh, trading and uh, having uh, activities. So really appreciate your time from your busy schedule. And uh, also, I understand FSDC has done a lot of work, not only with Hong Kong U, but other institutions in Hong Kong. So I appreciate your choice of Hong Kong U for this time. I think you did some talk uh, with uh, UST on FinTech, right? Some time ago, I hope you can do that with us as well in the future. So actually, I know both uh, companies uh, very well, both uh, Bank of East Asia and uh, Value Partners. So I think you can read uh, their bio and introduction. But here, I want to be more casual to share my learning and experience uh, for both over the past uh, 12 years and since I joined Hong Kong U. So the thing I want to emphasize to everyone is those two are the best Hong Kong local companies, local ground success. Right, uh, Bank of East Asia, definitely uh, no doubt. Hong Kong, uh, starting in Hong Kong and uh, succeed. Now actually serving like Great Bay, uh, Great uh, China area, and uh, is doing more and more. And the value partners, even though the founder, uh, Professor, uh, the founder actually Xie Qinghai is from Malaysia, 
he actually consider value partners as a Hong Kong company and uh, when we interact, he said uh, he will always hire people from Hong Kong because he said he benefits so much from Hong Kong and like to give back. So definitely they're both the best representatives in the asset management companies, the asset management industry. And uh, Hong Kong actually now want to do more in this space, not only uh, the particular like uh, stock bond trading, maybe even move to like uh, wealth management uh, related uh, professions. So I'm also happy to find out actually uh, uh, King and I share some background. We studied uh, particle physics both before. I didn't get my PhD, so I'm like uh, Dr. O actually finished his PhD. I dropped out. I got my master's in physics and I switched to finance. So I think uh, you will learn a lot from them about career in f like navigating the financial career, right? Because we st actually started from like physics to finance, so all the way, you know, they will share and also their prospects going forward. So again, it's a really great opportunity and uh, good people to, to be here to talk about uh, the financial career. And uh, I'm really proud to have our Hong Kong local successful companies and uh, entrepreneurs to share with us uh, today. So I don't want to take too much time. And uh, I will leave uh, more time for the Q&A, et cetera. But, uh... It's time to learn from our guest speakers about their advice and insights into financial services. Our first speaker is Dr. Al. May I invite Dr. Al to the stage, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to Professor Tang for his uh, kind introduction. Um, I've got quite a few slides, uh, so I'm not going to go through uh, all of them. Uh, but what I want to do is to give you an overview of uh, you know, the landscape of where we are in uh, asset management and then highlight uh, some of the uh, opportunities and challenges uh, that we face, especially as a local uh, Hong Kong companies. Uh, uh, this basically is a high-level summary or uh, overview of uh, where we are. Uh, I will talk about you know, investor behavior and, uh, most importantly, uh, how fintech is affect, uh, affecting our, com uh, our industry. Uh, so these are, are just background information. I'm not going to waste too much time on this. Uh, just to show you that uh, we, are, we have been very lucky because uh, asset management has been, been growing uh, quite healthily. And looking forward, uh, you can see that uh, growth rate at about 10% is very uh, respectable. But in fact, if you drill down the figures, I can give you some very interesting figures to remember. China now has by far the lar largest number of billionaires in the world, uh, 819. Uh, US only has 571. India comes third at 131. Japan has only 46. So that's you know, the, the potential uh, of China uh, to, to you all. But what is interesting um, is the, the pressure that we are facing in the industry. You might have heard of uh, free pressure. In fact, that phenomenon uh, you are seeing in other industry because of e-commerce, right? uh, online shopping. Right? But we have a, a, a similar kind of fee pressure in our industry, uh, passive ETFs. You know, are a lot cheaper than actively managed funds. But you look at uh, the uh, US market, actually we are seeing outflow in the traditional active product. But luckily for us so far, not so much in Asia Pacific. Mainly the reason is uh, we have a very different distribution model in Asia. Uh, products are mainly sold through banks and intermediaries such as insurance companies. Uh, but are, are, are they going to change? We'll see. Uh, apart from passive ETF, there's another the rising trend. That is more coming from Europe and US, mainly Europe, I would say, is uh, ESG. Uh, environmental policies, uh, social responsibility, and corporate governance. These are factors that a lot of institutional investors are looking for right now. But these are challenges uh, for Asian companies, because we are new to this kind of ESG concept. But as a fund manager, we have to you know, find the uh, right balance, meeting our clients' demand, but at the same time, trying to add value by buying the right companies, or companies that have 
great potential, but not all of them will meet the ESG uh, standard. Now, um, quickly to round up on landscape, uh, I put up the uh, MPF because if you are interested in the financial market in, Asia, uh, in Hong Kong, then you need to uh, find out more about MPF because if you look at the uh, uh, asset size, it's already 110 billion US dollar. The net inflow into MPF for the past few years have been larger than the net inflow into mutual funds. So that means MPF is already larger than the retail fund market in Hong Kong. And it's only going to become bigger because these are sticky money. And, but then the fee pressure also will become more prominent, partly because of regulation. And most importantly, with the introduction of EMPF, the distribution model in Hong Kong may change. The reason why EPF, uh, ETF is popular in the US because of the 401k plan. In a nutshell, it is a self-directed investment scheme. In, individuals make their own investment decisions. So obviously, it would be uh, you know, uh, easier to choose uh, the cheapest product. Might not be the best, but definitely the cheapest. Um, right. This is a big topic, uh, and I think this is where opportunities are uh, for all of you. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be a programmer. You can be a, a, a social scientist. You can be a linguist. You, know, you can be a historian. There are lots of opportunities. I'll, 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 I'll um, explain what I mean, uh, because actually we're having a, a shortage in this uh, particular field. Uh, I just had a quick chat with uh, Henry before the talk. We both are really looking for good, uh, very good solid investment writers, someone who can not just write good English and Chinese, but you know, uh, be creative enough to come up with strong selling points, good story for promoting our products. And this is important because of social media. Nowadays, you know, we are bombarded by information every day. You know, we're actually in an information explosion uh, era. Right? So getting the right message across to our customers is very important, right? So investment is not just about analyzing data anymore. But anyway, uh, you know, we all talk about asset, uh, investment because uh, you know, it's a key driver for uh, investment return and uh, the business. So nowadays, we spend a lot of time on get, collecting data. Uh, but a lot of these are actually garbage in, garbage out. So we are not looking for uh, just people who are good at programming. We are looking for people who have good intuition, understanding the data. Uh, so people are concerned that uh, machine learning may one day replace human. Uh, I hope uh, it is many, many years away uh, from reality uh, yet. And I'll, I'll cite a couple of examples, hopefully, to illustrate what I mean. But definitely AI, big data, machine learning, uh, having a big impact in our industry because it is replacing a lot of repetitive work, doing things a lot more effectively than, uh, than we can. You know, how many reports can you, uh, and, uh, uh, company reports can you read in a day? But with you know, big data, you can just scan for keywords and come up with a, a, a whole set of recommendations, pattern in seconds. Right? So we need people who have the creativity to interpret this data rather than uh, someone who are good at number crunching, because the machine can do, do it much faster than we can. But I don't think machine can replace human. Not yet. Uh, data are important because they offer a lot of advantage. We call information advantage. See, in, in our world, uh, Henry is an you know, investment expert. He can expand a, bit more, a, a lot more than, uh, on this than I can. But definitely, we are all looking at the, the, the same set of companies. You know, how can we outperform our peers? Hopefully, you know, we, we can discover things before they do. That's what I mean by information advantage. Uh, so big data provides a lot of advantage. Now, I won't go through all those four bullet points. But what is interesting is that we, they must lead to actionable ideas. Um, I'll, I'll share, you, uh, share with you an example uh, that uh, we actually uh, took advantage of uh, through big data. You may recall back in 2016 when iPhone 7 was uh, introduced, you know, first with the big screen, uh, there's iPhone 7 Plus, and then the normal uh, small screen iPhone 7 model. When, when the idea was first introduced, uh, everyone got excited. But the actual sales order was disappointing. Uh, so the, the uh, Apple share price actually got hit. 
And then, as, you know, because we look at Asian tech companies that provide components, right, to iPhone, so we needed to understand what happened. So we you know, just basically look at the sales order across the whole world. We found an interesting pattern. The analysts were, were, were correct. The sales order in developed countries, uh, major cities, were pathetic, like Hong Kong, New York, uh, uh, London. But places like China, India, Brazil, they shot up through the roof. And then we couldn't understand. The machine showed up the data, but couldn't explain why. So you know, um, we then went back uh, to all the iPhone order history. By the way, this is the power of big data. We managed to, run, uh, to go back to uh, iPhone 5. And then we spotted a very interesting pattern. iPhone 5, when it was first introduced uh, with some key features, I can't remember what, but it was uh, quite innovative at the time, for, I, for Apple at least. Uh, so we saw the same pattern. The uh, orders in emerging markets spied up. And then it went flat until iPhone 7 came along. Then this is where human intuition came in. We came to the conclusion that we, in uh, you know, the developed cities and countries, we change phone almost every year. So to us, iPhone 7 actually was at least one, year, one generation behind Samsung uh, or even Huawei. But to you know, uh, emerging market you know, uh, consumers, it took them time to save money. All right? So that. Uh, with that piece of information, we made a killing in the stock market by buying uh, the, the company that produced components for the iPhone 7 Plus, but shorting the company that created com uh, no, uh, com manufactured components for the small screen, uh, normal model. So that's one way of you know, combining technology and human intuition. There are other examples, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, I hope that you know, uh, alleviates some of the concern that you may have uh, of. Uh, us being replaced by human, uh, but by machines. But machines are very helpful. Uh, I mentioned about social media. You know, people you know with uh, different skill set from traditional analysts. Because right now, I, I talked about di distribution model uh, being very traditional in Hong Kong. But that uh, these are going to change, not just because of uh, the, the introduction of EMPF. For those who know about e EMPF, you don't who don't know about EMPF. It's a new regulation that will be introduced soon, allowing individuals to switch EPF, uh, MPF provider very easily. Uh, so giving investment decision back to, uh, to your hands. But as I mentioned, nowadays information uh, passed or uh, dissimulated through social media uh, rather than just emails, WhatsApp, right? WeChat, and others. Um, that means we need young people like you who understands the spending behavior the, uh, uh, and also the uh, consumer behavior of your generation. Right. Uh, These are, are, the, are the kind things we want to build over time. Uh, another um, I um, interesting area is uh, lateral language processing. Uh, nowadays, you, you probably have used a lot of uh, banking hotlines. People don't go, go to branches uh, uh, that much, uh, if any. Uh, so, a lot of these uh, inquiries are handled actually by machines, AIs, right? So we, I understand, you know, um, Linkwits, you know, not a, a very good programmer. So th there's a demand uh, for those as well, and there are quite a few um, of these uh, AI uh, startup that are offering their services to financial firms like ours. Uh, and it, it, and there's another interesting uh, development that is in our, our mid back office. There are lots of repetitive work. Now we use uh, robots to do those um, uh, repetitive work, 100% accuracy, 24 hours around the clock. Right. So uh, that uh, is uh, quite, quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a big impact to uh, the way uh, we operate. Uh, but uh, lastly, cybersecurity uh, becomes a big concern. Uh, there's now a huge demand for information risk, of risk officers out there in the market. My final punchline is that um, a fintech companies with their digital e ecosystems are going to eat our luncheons. I hope not, uh, but my, my comment on this is that for products that can be commoditized, what I mean is that it can be easily re uh, reproduced, replicated, can be sold at very low prices, low pricing, such as ETF, I think eventually 
they, they will be taken up by you know, distributors that have a, a much more efficient uh, ecosystem than banks and insurance companies and fund managers. But there are other products that uh, I think you know, we can still add value. I, I won't go through all this because it's quite technical, but uh, I think digital ID is very uh, uh, important in, in this uh, digital uh, age. You know, China is you know, way ahead of uh, every country, mainly because uh, you know, they have a very different set of uh, data privacy rule. Uh, and that's, a, a, to some extent, a big advantage in terms of uh, fintech development. Now, um, looking at uh, the role of Hong Kong um, in the globalization trend of uh, China, in fact, we all know that China um, has a lot of potential. I, I, won't, I need to repeat that. But Hong Kong has been playing this gateway for investment flow. I think a lot of people have overlooked the importance of Hong Kong being a risk management center. S uh, listing first you know, uh, Chinese uh, SOEs uh, on the stock exchange, uh, introduction of QFE, all these different quotas, as, uh, allowing foreign investors to uh, uh, access China. And one of the most important, uh, I, I think, job that we've done was being the first offshore renminbi center, allowing offshore renminbi assets to be created outside of China. Because if China is really to live up to our uh, dream, our ambition, right, uh, to, be, uh, to become a, a major dom dominant econ economy and political power in the world, renminbi has to become a reserve currency one day. But for, for that to happen, we must be able to offer overseas investors liquid renminbi assets. Otherwise, what are they going to do with all those uh, renminbi through trade with China? The only way they can do is to invest back to China. Right? And, and, and there's no incentive for them to keep renminbi as a storage of value like US dollar. Uh, and that explains why also US dollar, uh, well, the US uh, has become so powerful, mainly because everyone has to follow their lead. They, they, they have the global reserve currency. Um, now, uh, Greater Bay uh, is another opportunity for Hong Kong. Uh, from an asset management perspective, there are some interesting opportunities. First of all, you look at the size of Greater Bay area, we all know the statistics. The GDP is the same size of uh, South Korea. You, you all know about the mutual recognition of fund, I hope, basically, that they are Hong Kong Domus South fund that uh, can be sold into uh, China. Right. It, but there's a restriction. We, the ratio for f fundraising uh, in Hong Kong and China must be one to one. But Hong Kong being a very small market, seven million people, how much can you do in Hong Kong? Right? As a result, a lot of these funds are restricted by the small domestic size in Hong Kong. But GPA offers a solution. If we can re lift this restriction just for the Greater Bay Area, because Hong Kong now is part of a greater economic zone, that could be a catalyst for turning Hong Kong into a true financial uh, center, at least you know, a regional asset management center, uh, if not a global one. The other uh, ETF Connect, uh, again, um, it, 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 we can make the Greater Bay Area as one market you know, uh, for uh, Hong Kong double South ETF. Uh, another um, interesting development is uh, open and funded company. Um, again, it's getting very technical, but in a nutshell, a lot of alternative assets such as private equity, real estate funds, they are created as offshore vehicles, mainly doubles out in Cayman for historical tax reason and so on. The Hong Kong government has tried to, do, to create a similar framework but for Hong Kong doubles out product. But again, being a, a new kid right, on the block, it's very difficult to convince overseas investors, even Hong Kong investors, to buy into this new structure. So again, Greater Bay Area can provide the catalyst. If this vehicle, this kind of uh, 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 Hong Kong Double South vehicle, will be accepted by investors within the Greater Bay Area. Right. Now, uh, I hope that uh, will address some of uh, the questions you may have. You know, the employment landscape in Hong Kong. Things are changing gradually over the past 10 years. In fact, when I first came back to Hong Kong in, uh, uh, in the early 90s, Hong Kong really was a sales hub 
for global firms. Even nowadays, there aren't that many uh, successful local fund management firms, mainly because you know, it is a very demanding, very competitive industry. Uh, so therefore, that explains why you know, uh, almost 80% almost uh, at the time, 10 years ago, uh, were you know, salespeople. That number is gradually winding down, but the kind of salespeople we are looking for are very different from the ones that we hired 10 years ago. We are no longer looking for people that are just good at relationship management. We are looking at people who also are good at explaining things, technical things in simple layman language. And also very savvy with the use of technology because nowadays we need to find ways to engage our, our end clients, uh, even you know, working with our distributors, like a bank. They have got so many products on their platform. Why would they look at ours? Right. Obviously, performance is uh, one key driver, but performance is not a solution. If we don't have good after-sales service, we, we can't get across our message convincingly that there are many excuses not to sell our product. So that's why nowadays the, the, the sales skill set that we're looking for are not people who are good at whining, or whining and dining. It's a very different kind of skill set. Uh, um, and also, uh, the people, investors, especially more sophisticated ones, are looking for goal-oriented advice. No longer coming to us saying, that, oh, what's your best product? Uh, which, one, which fund shall I buy? They will come to you and say, I have these needs. I have a 10-year a, 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 a uh, investment target. How are you going to help me achieve that? Right? So we, we, we need people you know, who, you know, who can offer these kinds of holistic advice uh, so to, to our clients. Another um, in, in, uh, area that is growing is actually uh, fund administration. You'll be surprised, you know, I talked about technology replacing people, but actually this is also a growing area because Hong Kong is really trying to establish our own administrative uh, uh, infrastructure. I'll tell you why. Last slide. Ching Ching Rose and responsibility for uh, no, Hong Kong. I mentioned earlier, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was really just a sales hub. Uh, you know, starting off you know, as Hong Kong, and then we, you eventually evolved to a regional uh, uh, center. Now, we have an opportunity to become, definitely a lot of companies have their regional headquarters now in Hong Kong, but we, have an opportunity to become a global asset management centers because of the drivers I have highlighted here, some of the main drivers. China's huge demand for wealth management products and uh, services. The global demands for China investment. You all have probably have read about the MSCI uh, inclusion factor uh, quadrupling from 5% to 20% uh, by the end of November. On a, based on a uh, very conservative uh, estimate, that implies a, a 70 billion US dollar of inflow into China A shares uh, due to indexing. Right. Um, RMB internationalization, I already mentioned uh, 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 the importance of that, creating RMB assets offshore. Uh, so the, the final point I want to mention that also links to uh, what I meant by Hong Kong being a risk man management center. I, I, I believe you know, some of you uh, at least would have uh, bought uh, investment funds uh, before. Do you realize a lot of these funds are actually domiciled in Europe and not in Hong Kong, right? If we were to open up the market, offer these funds to Chinese investors, but this is my own personal uh, view, so it doesn't represent value partner. Uh, there's a big risk. Because if something goes wrong, who has the ultimate control of these assets? European regulators, not Chinese regulators, not Chinese investors. So that's the importance of Hong Kong creating our own regulatory regime. That's why MLF, when it was first introduced, uh, it was not really very popular because a lot of fund managers had to create Hong Kong dollars out funds in order to sell their product into China. But behind it, I believe there is a very strong reason for doing that. It's about 
regulatory ownership and control. And the same applies to OFC that I just mentioned. Uh, so I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, for, for all of you. Uh, you're young, you're bright, you're ambitious, uh, upwardly mobile. Uh, but I, I, what, what I want to say is that you know, in order to go uh, global, we also need to make sure that you know, we preserve our local characteristics. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Al, for the insightful sharing. Please be seated. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Chen to the stage to share his experience with us. Mr. Chen, please. Right. OK. Well, I'll just click it here. Hey. Professor Tang. Dr. Ao, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's indeed a beautiful afternoon, and you should all be enjoying your nice coffee outside. And, but uh, to thank you for staying with us, I offer you something to drink to begin, uh, probably in a different form. So let's watch a video. Where's the click? Just click? Oh, no. No. Can't find it, sorry. so easy. So what does this guy do? So he just stands in front of the goal and every time he tap in. And so yes, in the right place at the right time, uh, while well, I'm a big football fan, uh, yeah, for those who come from North America, sorry, I mean, football means we use our feet to kick the ball <laughs> and not to grab in your tummy and knock off people along the way. Okay, so, so okay, so who's Gary Lineker? He's England football captain. Uh, in 1986, he's the top scorer in the World Cup. Yes, you're right, uh, 1986, uh, only old men like me sort of know, know what happened then. You know, most of you were probably not born yet. Well, uh, he's a really gentleman. He never had a yellow card or a red card, and he scored like uh, 330 goals for his clubs and country. So why I brought out uh, Gary Lineker, well, I will bring him back later in the talk. But uh, every time people talk about him in the right place, at the right time, people talk about him. Now, yeah, it looks so easy. So your career, your life, you always want to be like him. You want to be getting into the right place. But here are some, a couple of questions here. As a career, what, what are the right places? Dr. Ao gave us a fantastic presentation. There are a lot of right places you can go into. But second question is, how do you get there? How do you get there at the right time also. So perhaps I share with you some of my own stories, whether it's my life, my career, hopefully will give you a little bit of a flavor of what sort of things to come. Everybody has their own story. Everybody has a different way of doing things. So this is not supposed to be something that you can copy. But I always believe that by sharing with everyone, you can formulate your own way of getting things done. So, yeah, talking about football, let's go back to my school days. I, I like to play football, as I mentioned. So when I entered secondary school, I went for the football trial. I thought I was good. Uh, by the end of the trial, I realized I was not. So 
the coach grabbed me and another player around and said, look, you guys are actually not good enough to be in the team, but uh, we have one extra space. I can take one of you on. So he talked to the other player. So what can you offer? What positions can you play? I can play in any positions except goalkeeper. So he turned to me. So Henry, what can you play? I can play in any position, including goalkeeper. <laughs> nice. So, so thank you, Henry. You are in. So I got my spot. So the coach later on told me, we have a number three goalkeeper place for you. Number three goalkeeper. So I'm the backup goalkeeper of the backup goalkeeper. <laughs> nice. So I went through the training, and then I realized how hard it is to become a good footballer. I mean, I, I just played casually during my primary school day. So that was the first time I ever got a chance to go through some formal training. It was hard. After the first day of training, I, mo I almost couldn't get back to school the next day. So, but still, I tried to work myself away. You know, I tried to catch up with the people. And so finally, the, the inter-school matches sort of were finally arrived. So as a backup goalkeeper of the backup goalkeeper, I, I tried to stay very visible in front of the coach so that he still remember I, I'm, I'm part of the team. So going into the third match, so I was uh, always hoping, hey, maybe the main goalkeeper could be injured and the second goalkeeper happened to have a date with his girlfriend so he might go away. So, so I was dressed, so I keep sort of uh, walking around the, in front of the coach, and hopefully I got a chance. As it happened, it was the striker who got injured, and the backup striker, I don't know where he was. So, yeah, he probably went out with his girlfriend. And so as the main striker got injured, the coach turned around and saw me and said, Henry, yeah, you just go in front. You're tall enough. Yeah, I know you can't score goals, but... Uh, just, just run around, confuse people, and someone else will score. Okay, so, so great. So I had my beautiful first match. I, I actually almost forgot that when I tried to join the football team, I wanted to be a striker. And, well, it's kind of my dream come true. Uh, I, I, I sort of started off as a striker. So towards the end of the match, another team, teammate sort of came around and said, Hey, Henry, great. You are in the right place at the right time. You're just standing next to the coach, and you want to play here, you are there. Thank you. And the coach walked by and overheard us. And the coach said, do you think I'm stupid? Look, I mean, this guy, yes, he's crap. But he trained very hard. I know what he can do. I'm just waiting for the opportunity to introduce him. So whether he's in front of me, he's, I know he's there. It's just that I'm right waiting for the time to put him on. So I look back and say, look, I mean, had I not accepted the place of a backup goalkeeper of a backup goalkeeper, uh, I would never have the chance to become a striker. So let's fast forward many years later. So I, I joined the industry in 1995. So it was a big team. China was hot. Everybody wanted to be a China fund manager. Everybody wanted to be an Asian fund manager. So I joined the team so that the essays are Greater China analyst. So I applied to the, respond to the ad and say, I got in. So, so I said, oh, Henry, by the way, so if Greater China, we have a fantastic market for you to cover is Taiwan. So at that time, Taiwan was tiny. Even Indonesia had a bigger index weighting than Taiwan. There was no technology sector. 70% of the, of, the, of the whole market was sort of a financials, the insurance companies and all the banks that you never want to be invested. Um, so, yeah, okay, I, I, I'll take the job. I mean, people feel very sorry. I mean, this new, this new guy coming in. The, so I, the interesting thing is that because since nobody covered Taiwan in Hong Kong, I mean, uh, I, I seem to be standing out eventually. I mean, I, I managed a Taiwan fund. It worked well. And by the time, year 2000, probably a lot of you remember is the TMT bubble. So suddenly I receive a lot of phone calls and say, hey, do you want to be a technology analyst? I, I give you a premium to go. Luckily, I didn't take that because that was two, two months before the burst of the bubble. So I will be on the street had I accepted that job. But Taiwan, the fact that I accepted this role of a Taiwan analyst 
maybe as a Taiwan fund manager, for many times it's actually saved my career or earned my promotion. Had I not done Taiwan, I would never have a chance to become a Greater China manager. I would never have become like a, a manager of the Penn Regional, looking at everything. So, so Taiwan is my kind of a door opener. I started to do Taiwan, I did well, and I work hard, I learned the China market. I work hard to learn the rest of Asia. Now, everybody has the strength, okay? You, you guys, you have to be the cream of the crop to be sitting here as a Hong Kong U student. Why the opportunity would go to you, go to you, and not other smart people around here? It, it's not as obvious as you say, oh, this guy is always lucky. So, Henry, you happen to be standing there doing technology, so you got all the jobs. But, well, uh, hang on a second, I've been doing Taiwan for five years. Nobody sort of uh, realized that what had been the work going into it. And so, but the, the key is always, I feel, whether as a backup goalkeeper, whether as someone who is doing a relatively minor market. I mean, think about your strength. Had I sort of went in and say, I want to compete with the best striker, I would never have gone into the school team to begin with. Had I went in to say, it's only the China market I would cover and nothing else, I would never eventually become a China market manager. So, Every one of you has your strength. Keep thinking, that's my way of doing things, is that try to get your strength to get into what you want to be and improve yourself. That will take you to the next level. As you are going to the next level, yeah, find a way to going in. Uh, I was talking to Dr. Ao just now and say, we, the, way, the, the part that we are struggling to find uh, it's actually investment writers. So strange enough, I mean, in the finance industry, we need someone to, who can write. If you are a nice writer, so submit your CV to us. I mean, we, we need that. So, so there are ways, as I say, if I came closer to investment, um, there are two types. Well, I won't say two types of investors. There are two ways of investing, you can say. One is that, as you probably would think, you spot the right trend. Oh, there's, a, there's a technology boom. Uh, there's a social media boom. There's a biotech boom. So you spot the right industry. You spot the right name. You're flying. There are people who are not as sharp, not as smart like me, who would say, I try to get very familiar with the stocks I cover. They are the stocks who will be there forever. There are good times and the bad times. I want to be prepared. When the right price comes, I'll be able to come in a position to capture that. Now, if you expand to life, you expand to the kind of career that you are, you are pursuing, even for our industry, who seems that you have so much information coming in, a lot of times, you want to be prepared. I mean, I, I used to be, uh, when I joined the industry, apart from Taiwan, I covered the chemical sector. So, well, I hated chemistry. Um, so within like two weeks, I need to learn all the, how you mix the two chemicals products into the next one. So, so in, in 1995, um, so I've done a lot of work and I made a call to say, look, this is the peak of the cycle. So in the next three years, you probably don't need to look at the sector. So, so I make sure, I eventually I make a call to make myself redundant. Okay. Um, so, so I was right, unluckily. So three years, nobody sort of bothered to look at my sector. So every year I look at the sector and say, um, is it the right time to go back? Every year I came back and say, no, it's not the right time to go back. So when it comes to 1999, uh, right after the Asian financial crisis, there was massive liquidity going to the system, economies were recovering, and so I look at those stocks again. Wow, it's so depressed. Nobody look at it. Even the, the fellow chemical analysts, they were all sort of covering technology already. 
So I, I said, look, it's the right time to go into these names. And, and as soon as I bought recommend to buy those stocks, well, it was a boom. And people say, well, Henry, you, you're great. You're in the right place at the right time. But hang on a second. I mean, I have been waiting for that for four years. Now, so as I said, you can be exceptionally smart and jump from one place to another. But at the same time, you can also be very sharp in doing well in one area, improve yourself, get into something that you wouldn't have been got going into, and, and just move on. Now, I promise to go back to Gary. Listen to what he said, and probably it's something that you might want to think about. Okay, so... No anticipation, if you like. I think people often say about a player that scores goals, he's in the right, he's in the right place at the right time. Um, that's true, but the, the answer to that is, is to be in the right place all the time. Um, the thing I always do is I make a run and I'll decide. I'll just take a chance to go for a space. I'll make sure I get there in front of the defender. And then if the ball comes to me, well, that's great. So if I make 15, 20 of those runs in a game and the ball comes to me once and I'm all on my own two yards out from goal, everybody will say, well, he's in the right place at the right time. But the answer is to be in that place all the time. Then eventually when the ball does come to the right place, you're there. So what does he say? So it's being in the right place all the time. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm sure you're all very smart people. And... The thing I want to share here is get yourself ready. And hopefully, when the opportunity comes, you are there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen, for the inspiring sharing. Please take a seat on the stage. May I also invite Dr. Al to join the stage for the Q&A session. Today, I'm very much honored to have two distinguished guest speakers to be on the stage with me. If, um, uh, this is not only a discussion among the speakers, but also an open Q&A session. If you have any questions, please raise up your hand and someone will pass you the mic. Please state your name, organization, or faculty you're from, and which subject. I'm sure that Testing, testing. Okay, uh, I'm from Hong, uh, University of Hong Kong, and I'm a year one student from uh, AMPB. It's a new subject. Uh, in 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 long term, it's, it's called asset management and private banking. It's a finance program. Okay. Um, so my question is, uh, uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, books about value investing, and I really appreciate uh, how uh, investment organizations in Hong Kong, including Federal Partners, being one of the most prominent one who have been adopting and executing these policies over the past uh, three to four decades, I guess. And so my, my question is that uh, if uh, I were to be uh, one of the uh, position of your company, such as being an analyst, uh, what will enhance my chance of uh, getting the post? For example, uh, will I, if, if I happen to write a research report about one of my favorite stocks, or uh, if I lay out my plan about my investment strategy, would it uh, kind of enhance my chance to get a post? Because, yeah, obviously, I think it's really fascinating to be in a workplace with people with similar thoughts. Thanks. Uh, first, first of all, uh, thanks for you know, uh, having an interest in uh, value partners and uh, believing in value investing. Uh, I, uh, the kind of uh, recruits we look for uh, are ones that can uh, offer what we call differentiated value. What it means is that you know, they have to demonstrate why they're different from the others. Right? It could be the way they do the, uh, the analysis. Um, they, they, may, they may say something completely wrong, but it's not whether they're saying the right thing. It's the, 
the thought process that we are looking for. Right? We need to find uh, people you know, who can really contribute to our process. Because uh, we have a lot of bright analysts and fund managers working in the team. So you really have to offer the, what we call differentiated value. This is the term that we use throughout our company, no matter which division you are in. Right? We are looking for people who can offer differentiated value. Yeah. I hope I've answered your question. As the audience do not have the question right now, I actually have a question. Just now we saw from the sharing from Mr. Chen of the football player, he said that um, he is at the right place all the time. But um, in my personal opinion, I think that the reason why he came to a success is because he might be lucky that he is in the right place all the time. But I may not be as lucky to be in the right place all the time. So um, from your years of experience, how do you, what do you think is the right time to move from one place to another if you happen not to be as, as lucky as him? Okay. <laughs> how long you want to stay in the company? Um, well, in, it seems that during my time, people talk about at least three years. And, Apparently, people talk about uh, every three months uh, these days. But uh, um, I, I would say um, one year at least, three years more ideal. You you have to stay in the same place long enough to to really to make the most out of it. Your your first three to six months, you you are in an adjustment mode. So it's not until you get into your maybe six. After half a year, you start to get into a bit of a momentum. And then you started to, to, to think you, you have to move on. Um, it's very difficult to get the most out of a job. And think longer term. Think about your ultimate goal. Yeah, you might not, as I said, I mean, you, you might not get to the right spot immediately. But every step you get closer, um, think about what you can offer as well. Um, very often, I mean, I, uh, I met with candidates and they came in and they set up all their expectations. And towards the end of the discussion, I say, so what can you bring to the table? Um, the thing about what you can bring to the table, you get in, um, people will make use of your skill and you will get closer to what you ultimately want to achieve. I want to add uh, to that too. Uh, I fully agree with uh, what Henry just said. I think um, I've done a lot of interviews uh, in, in the past over my career. I think one problem I have with a lot of candidates is that they change job too frequently. That immediately creates a doubt in the, in the you know, interviewer's mind. Right? Once acceptable, try three times, right? then yeah. You, you, you start asking, you know, having doubt in the mind. Uh, obviously, they can always come up with uh, explanations. But again, it, it's this doubt factor that you create in people's mind uh, is uh, a very uh, bad first impression. And also, uh, I agree with Henry, showing commitment is very important. It's, it's a two-way street. Yeah. And it's not just what the company can offer you. It's uh, you know, why the company uh, you know, wants to hire you. Uh, and I think um, I always say to my colleagues that uh, you have to enjoy going to work every day because you spend more time in the office with your colleagues than with your family. Right? So if you are not happy, then you have to speak to someone, speak to your supervisor, speak to your colleagues. Yeah. Um, both of Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I used to be a trader, uh, and I'm now running a financial education company in Hong Kong. Um, given how much technology has changed the industry, uh, the job nature of a fund manager, trader, and sales is very different now compared to three years, five years, seven years ago. Uh, do you think universities in Hong Kong and globally are adapting fast enough to equip students with the skills that they need?
perhaps I answer it in a slightly different way. I share it with a, 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 a little story. So when, when I was in my, sorry, I go back to my school days, when I, in the last year in, in, in secondary schools, I went to a scholarship interview. So uh, we talk about computers at that time. And, and I said, yeah, computer is going to change the world. So the, the chairman of the board turned around and said, so, so why didn't you study computer? So I said, I never need to learn to use a calculator. So in the future, computers are like calculators. Now, why do I need to study a bachelor degree in computer or a bachelor degree in calculator in order to use a calculator? Now, I, I think it's the same. I, I wrote an article in the, in the blog in the FSDC thing. I say, the is it technology or the mentality? We train people to be good user of machines. We don't train people to become machines. So yes, I mean, I, I, I don't know the curriculum these days. But I think that one thing is very important, which I, I want to, whether it's directly related to your question or the or your things, well, why, is that you is think about I always what, what, what is your competitive advantage. And technology is something that is a tool to you as always. Um, I don't know how the university program is structured these days, but uh, it's, it's, it's about whichever way it's structured, I mean, our mentality should be how we can make use of the technology and differentiate ourselves. Dr. I'll talk about differentiation. You come in to, do, to say, I'm the best kind of number cruncher in the world. I mean, uh, sorry, there's a, something called a computer here. And so you're not going to get in for that. So I'm not sure whether that answered your question, though. Okay. Oh, I'll share my thoughts on this because, uh, in a way, I lived through this uh, kind of change uh, myself. Uh, first of all, I think uh, having a good solid curriculum is important. Uh, having the basic understanding uh, of finance uh, is, is key because you're working in the industry. You must have some basic financial knowledge. Take myself an example. I joined the industry really by chance. I always wanted to be an academic <laughs> uh, when I was a student. That's why I did my PhD. Uh, Cut the long story short, I was hired because at the time the market needed someone who was good at number crunching and uh, doing option pricing. You know, to me, it was just you know basic ABC. Uh, but to uh, people who you know, didn't have the right math exposure, mathematical exposure, thought they were very complex. But guess what? I was sent to business school for uh, on and off for a year to learn the basic before I could do my job properly. Right? So. Um, but you have to go back to the basic. You know, there are a lot of fintech companies trying to offer their services to uh, financial industry. Some of them success. Uh, uh, no, some of them are, are, are successful. Some of them are not. Partly because of regulation. If the founders don't understand the regulation, they may come up with products that are not useless to 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 uh, their, their their customers. And again, if they don't understand the needs of their clients, such as you no. Know, you know, the end user financial firms. You have a solid understanding of basic financial discipline and knowledge. They won't be come up, coming up with the right product. So I think having a solid understanding in whatever you do uh, is, uh, I think, a, a key success factor. Uh, thanks for sharing. Actually, I graduated five years ago from the real estate program. I'm currently between the jobs, and I live close to campus, so I came here today for this presentation. And I got two questions. So first, you're saying the current trend is a technology to imply in this asset management industry. I'm curious in your own business, how how much you get, get this fintech involved? Because my previous job in the real is a private equity firm, and we just have one, two funds in our office. We're just using Excel to do all the work. So I'm curious whether this is actually a trend, just people just talking about them, but there's no actual implementation or only institutional investor they, to use this kind of technology. And my second question is about you two saying very important for investment right there. And I'm curious for this question too, because see, for example, like insurance company, they they try to understand what the end customers want so they can to do the right asset allocation into the right uh, fund, uh, hedge fund or private equity. But for this part, it's about to appeal to the customer what they want, or you need, also need to educate the customer what's the right trend you should invest in. Thanks. 
I'll, I'll have a, 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 a go first. Um, so you know, the investment uh, writing first, right? The, uh, and, uh, so uh, I think that it, the, uh, I mentioned about social media. Actually, nowadays, uh, I, I guess a lot of you spend more time watching video than text, right? And um, so we're looking for people who have the creativity, right? Have the ability to bridge the gap, right? You, if you want to educate people, you need sometimes to go through a, a lot of uh, reasons, a lot of uh, justification and explanation. But how are you going to translate those into punchlines, into short sentences, paragraphs, to capture uh, users' attention or your audience attention? I think this is you know, the skill set we're looking for. You know, uh, you know, uh, in the writing, uh, good, solid academic articles, I think you know, there are a lot of people who can do it. But you know, the, 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 those who have the ability to condense the, the key messages and put it into uh, a, a user acceptable form. Uh, I mean, I think it, it, it's really the, what I call the value differentiator, the key differentiator. Right. Uh, so uh, your first question, technology. I think it's a, it's a very good question. It depends on uh, the resources of each company. I can give you two extreme examples. I know one of our business partners is a global US bank. Two years ago, when they told me they were going to s scrap their uh, brick and mortar IT infrastructure, I thought they were joking, right? Because for bank, you know, uh, you know, because for security reasons, a lot of the systems uh, have been built in-house over the years. But that also becomes a problem because it, they become dinosaur, right? Uh, and to, they, they decided to make a bold decision of s s scrapping the whole traditional infrastructure and move on to cloud. And allowing their business partners like us to, create, to link to their uh, platform, tap into their client base. Obviously, they still own the clients but we can offer our services indirectly to the, to the clients through their platform uh, using APIs. And basically, you know, uh, developing tools that can tap, uh, tap onto their platform. We are not there yet, but I know, uh, you know some of uh, our competitors who have much more resources than us uh, are already doing that. Uh, so that it is uh, what, uh, there, there are definitely some companies that are very bold in adopting technology. Uh, and there are others, uh, you know, who have uh, more limited resources. We have to consider uh, either doing uh, investment in some of these companies as a, 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 as a, as a side bet, right? Uh, because a lot, lot, a lot of companies have the even if we, we have the resources, we may not have the uh, technical know-how. Right. Uh, so it, it is a, for us, for example, you know, we, we are adopting technology, but uh, but not at an even, uh, very even pace. For on the investment team side, uh, we've been doing that a lot because it's easier uh, to implement, like big data, right? For example, you just uh, you know, more traditional analytical approach, but changing the the, the way we operate, right? uh, like what I just mentioned, the back office, right? That will take time. Uh, so there is a bit of trial and error. Uh, so, so there's no, I, I don't think there's a, a universal solution to that. I think if you take FinTech, uh, uh, first of all, I said it, it, it took me quite a while to understand what, what FinTech is actually about. Uh, well, I mean, uh, in, in, in layman term means uh, software, I mean, to me all, but a little bit more sophisticated, I might have to say. I think in the wider context, if you look at many different industries, the rise of technology, well, in our area, the fintech, in fact, it, it kind of polarizes the competitive land space. On one hand, you allow a lot of startups to flourish because your, your, your fixed cost, you can always outsource. You have some more readily available solutions. On the other hand, for the bigger guys, you the investment in technology becomes more and more important. Not all the big houses would be able to kind of outsource everything. So in turn, some of them, they have to, to create a, a critical mass. They create a scale. So, so you can see in our industry, you have more and more, you can say, smaller players, the niche players. But at the same time, you see big consolidation at the top. Everybody is doing M&A. So, uh, uh, 
something that's had implication in our industry is that the, the technology or the fintech actually create a very different competitive landscape, uh, which, um, uh, which, which keeps sort of moving the industry or changing the industry. Um, so the fintech, um, it applies to your scale, it also applies to the kind of a product you can actually offer. Yes. Uh, uh, um, picking up on Henry's point, scale, uh, you know, you probably have heard of a networking effect. I mean, that's uh, what uh, a lot of these uh, fintech companies are good at. They build their own ecosystem. You start by using, let's say, their messaging service. Then you end up using their uh, e-payment. Later on, you use them uh, 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 as your online shopping platform. Uh, and now uh, you're buying financial products from them. And later on, uh, you may even take out loans from them. They, they probably have the, uh, a better risk management uh, tools than banks because they monitor all your spending behavior. So, yeah. Uh, so fin fintech uh, definitely is here to stay. I think, uh, uh, but we also need to learn how to uh, adapt. Uh, thanks for sharing. I have a question about uh, KYC and AML. Um, I'm very interested in this field, and my past internship is also uh, in this area. But as you mentioned like fintech is playing an important role in this area because we can use those technology to help deal with this issue but i also think that there are some aspects in kyc that is not able to be replaced by pure technology because you need to like really know about your customer it's kind of like i feel it's kind of like detective job <laughs> And so I want you to know, like, what, what do you think are the things that are not replaceable by FinTech and what are the aspects that might be replaced? And the second question related to this topic is that, um, do you advise, like, graduate to directly uh, take on jobs in this field, I mean, KYC and AML, or is it better to start with the other aspect, like more front office job, and then um, do this kind of job later? Thank you. Uh, I'll have a go first. Uh, I guess uh, that's uh, something we are uh, us looking at quite closely, uh, KYC, uh, it, because globally regulations are, are, are getting tighter and more complex. Uh, so when you say when we say KYC, it's really more about onboarding, knowing the uh, source of funding, knowing the background of the client. When you say, uh, look, I want to distinguish that from client servicing, because that's the onboarding is the very first step. Knowing that uh, the the background is clean, then you can start servicing your client, and that's the next step. Learning about uh, their need. Uh, trying to offer them advice that are suitable, then you need engagement. And that's now where now technology helps a lot. Right? Uh, so take for example, now, nowadays you know, we're trying to use more iPads uh, 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 in meetings. This is more graphic, more interactive, rather than showing them a paper, oops, sorry, paper presentation. Right? And, and, and you know, with uh, you know, these kind of digital platforms, you can you know, go deeper, you know, show them graphic and the layers of, uh, you know, uh, touch points, right? Going, uh, you know, so the, the, that is different from uh, KYC, right, uh, uh, and AML. Uh, and definitely co uh, compliance is a, an AML is a growth area. Uh, it is getting uh, more demanding uh, in terms of, uh, transparency in terms of uh, regulatory reporting. Uh, it, it is a global trend, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think uh, probably these are a bit two quite separate area, whether you're the, the front office, the, the analyst, the portfolio managers, or the, the, the AML or the KYC onboarding, that's more a, a middle office or a back office operation. So um, from my experience is that people tend to pursue uh, one path or the other. Of course, I mean, the people going into senior management, they, they could come from many different backgrounds. 
whether it's from the front office, the investment, or they could be someone from the operation side. So, um, yeah, I think go back is depends on what your sort of aspiration and what your strengths are, and that determine which way you want to go. Yes, uh, you're right. Yeah, I, uh, you you need to feel comfortable uh, what you do. You basically going back to what I said. You ha you you need to be happy at work, right? It's not that because some someone thinks that kind of job uh, is glamorous, therefore I must go for it. It's actually at the day is whether that's the best uh, wh wh whether that's the best opportunity for you. Whether you you really happy you know, doing that role, uh, you know, long term. Yeah. As time is running short, we can only answer one last question. Hi, uh, thank you for your sharing. Uh, my name is Melody, and uh, I'm a master's degree student from Hong Kong U. Um, actually, I have done both of my undergrad and uh, master's degree in psychology, but now I'm actually considering uh, to start my career in the in insurance industry. So I would like to ask that, um, how would you prospect the development of in insurance industry, uh, especially in the Greater Bay Area in the future? And uh, what are some of the possible um, challenges um, of this industry, um, especially for the Hong Kong, some of the Hong Kong companies' um, challenges in terms of like with the development of the technology um, having on the industry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so insurance. Uh, I, I worked um, for an insurance company uh, for a, a brief uh, period. But I have served uh, a lot of insurance companies uh, over the years. I think insurance, are like asset management, is a highly regulated uh, industry. Uh, so, by the way, uh, you know, your degree is very valuable nowadays, psychology. You know, uh, we are actually looking at something that is related to psychology called the biasing. Yeah, right? You probably know what I mean. Uh, they're basically trying to d remove uh, our behavioral bias in decision making. That's what we are now uh, working on with our fund managers. So psychology is definitely a very valuable uh, discipline. Uh, uh, so I don't know how, how that will be applied to insurance, but uh, definitely the regulation is, is the key. And also insurance, uh, as far as I know, uh, is being uh, affected by technology as well, right? Uh, because it, we're talking about mass distribution. So technology definitely uh, will uh, be a key. Uh, for efficiency, right, for cost control, and uh, I think more importantly, uh, distribution. Because uh, the traditional uh, RM model uh, is it, not effective. Uh, it's a lot of insurance companies still have a, a, a very large uh, direct sales uh, agency force, but I think over time uh, that will change. Uh, and yeah, so that, that's my personal view. I think, I think for, no, I, I'm speaking more from the investment standpoint, is that um, in Asia, one of the major challenges for insurance, or investment for insurance companies that we are doing actually, is that to, to find enough instruments, particularly on the fixed income side, because a typical insurance plan, you need a lot of fixed income, a little bit of equities. You want to be very safe. You don't sort of bet your farm on the, insurance assets. But in Asia, you, you want to, you, the, the interest rates are a bit higher than the, the, the developed countries. And there's actually a, a shortage of bonds, of good investment grade bonds to buy. It, it's always a struggle to find enough names, enough assets. So uh, you can say this is a potentially uh, a strong area or high growth area. That's the, the, the fixed income market. I think when it comes to investment, a lot of people would easily they think about uh, equities. But in fact, fixed income is actually the fast growing market. The, the fixed income assets in this part of the world, as a percentage of the total investment, is way uh, lower than the, uh, the developed country. So this is an area for those who are interested in pursuing a career. Uh, don't just think about equities. I mean, fixed income is, a, is actually a fast growing area. Here comes to the end of today's forum. 
Thank you all for the questions, and let's give a round of applause to our guest speakers. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you all in future events. Before you leave, don't forget to hand in your questionnaire to our staff. Thank you.